This is my confession. It all started with the local jocks. Those pompous asses with their fucking football jackets and their cars paid with daddy's money. I hated them. So much. I wasn't even one of their targets. I wasn't one of the nerds. I didn't have any disability. and never belonged to any specific clique. I was normal. Or, at least I tried really hard to appear that way. You can get away with anything when you're a regular kid. At school, the air was still tense. It had been six months since Megan disappeared, and there were posters around plastered on every hallway. I did feel guilty about what happened to her, but business is business. The money was just too good, and if I ever woke up thinking of her, I'd just tell myself, you're just a middleman, that's what you are, just a middleman, and right now you're not even that. Right now, you're just Pete. Everyone called me Pete, and everyone called me a friend. What they didn't know about me is that it's all a farce. Pete's my name, sure, but over the last few years it's become more of a character. Pete is my shield. It's the thing that keeps me safe. During the day, I wear Pete's outfit and his winning smile to school. I volunteer to help out in the afternoons. I even go to church with my grandma every Sunday. But when I come home, I remove the Pete outfit and I can truly be myself once I open up my laptop. It takes a lot of know-how to do what I do, so I'll spare you the details. But I'm sure that at some point you've heard of this dark web, this whole section of the internet that you can't access without regular means. Since people can't access it normally, it's become a hub of illegal activity. While some users get in there only because they value their privacy, many others do it for far more nefarious purposes. And this is how the world works. There's a need, so the market finds a way to fulfill that need. I began that night pretty late. Pete was, I mean, I was invited to a party, so I had to go. I kept to myself, speaking to a group of people, when one of the jocks Mike took me to the side with a beer in his hand. Hey, Pete, my man! He wasn't slurring his words just yet, but he had been drinking. I could feel it in his breath. He had his arm around my shoulders as if we were lifelong friends. I awkwardly got myself freed from him. Hey, Mike, how are you? I tried in a calm tone of voice. Had he been sober, he would have caught the annoyance in my voice. Hey, I'm cool, I'm cool. So, listen, I hear you're like good with computers and shit. I was. It was one of Pete's hobbies. He had to be known for something, so that's what I was. A computer guy, who dressed well enough not to be called a nerd. So, there's this party I'm throwing at my house next week. You're invited, by the way. Great. Another one of these. And we're looking to score something really special, you know what I'm saying? Of course, everyone knew that Mike and all the players in the football team were massive junkies. How they were never caught with one of those surprise urine tests is beyond me. I nodded and he continued. Thing is, my dealer's out of town and I need to get something ASAP. And I heard you may know a guy who's into some shit. The way he said that gave me pause. What does he know? If there were any insecurities, I managed to keep them from showing on my face. I tried to deflect. Hey man, I have no idea what you mean. I'm the guy you call if your printer's broken. What does this have to do with getting, you know, stuff for the party? He looked at me and said, I heard you know about the dark web. You can access it. I know there's all sorts of stuff there and I was hoping you could help a friend out. Since when are we friends? I nearly asked. At that moment, I was going to make an excuse and leave. But then, I thought, Mike is rich, his family's loaded, and I did hear those rumors. I think he's into some shit too. Plus... He's an ass. It'd be fun to take him down a peg. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. I don't know anything about that really, but I may know a guy who knows a guy. I'll ask around and if they're up for it, they'll reach out to you, I said. Mike's eyes lit up and he smiled. His cheeks were redder now. That's my man! He patted me on the back and went back with his people. Later that night, I returned home and fired up my system. Have you heard of those dark web mystery boxes? Those are fake. The real dark web is a lot worse than something you'll see on some YouTube channel. Far, far worse. And I should know, because that's how I earn my living. I can put you in contact with dealers of any substance. Illegal weapons, contract killing, you name it. You pay me, and I keep the money safe until you get the service. Then I send the payment to your seller, and everyone's happy. All I ask is 10% of the transaction. It may not sound like a lot, but earning the web's trust is difficult, and I'm a man of my word. I made hundreds of thousands of dollars in all sorts of digital currency. If all goes well, by the time I'm 18, I'll be a millionaire. 
I reached out to Mike via email. He answered asking me how I got his info, and I said he shouldn't worry about that. I asked what he was trying to score, and he said he was looking for psychedelic mushrooms, a particular kind that you can't get in the US that would be expensive. But, as always, I know a guy. I reached out to the seller. They gave me the price and I got back to Mike, explaining everything. He sent the money, even though the price was very steep. The seller got to work. Mike sent one last email, asking me to let Pete know he should deliver the goods himself to the party on Friday. I was sure to let him know that this would not happen. He seemed upset by it, but the transaction still went through. Mike had been stupid enough to use his school email for this. Jocks are not very smart, I suspect and having his email address allowed me to mine for some of his personal information. Now, he had a purchase of an illegal substance tied to his school ID. I had broken into the school database a million times, so collecting all his info and tying him to the purchase was easy. Not even all of daddy's lawyers could help him. I spent the rest of the week putting everything together in a single encrypted file, which I'd send to the FBI anonymously, along with the key to decrypt it. But I noticed strange behavior on my computer. Files were in places where I never put them, my system would randomly freeze, and several times it crashed for no reason, forcing a reboot. That Friday, I woke up to a message in my inbox. We know, it said. A chill ran down my spine. The only thing I could think to do was to move all my crypto to an external drive and take that with me somewhere safe. I disconnected the whole system and took it to my car. I drove around the inner city until dark, when I found a homeless encampment. Some of the homeless were warming their hands to a fire that raged inside a can. I went in and dropped my laptop and the rest of my equipment into the pyre. When I drove home, I saw them from a distance. Several black vans, red and blue lights, and men with FBI coats coming in and out of my house. I was too late. I drove away as fast as I could, my mind racing, asking myself how the fuck they were able to catch me. I'd been so careful. My phone rang. Unknown number. As a rule, I never answered my phone, but curiosity got the better of me. I needed to know. Hey, Pete. It was Mike. His voice was different now. Cold. Calculating. But he also seemed to be enjoying himself. What the fuck? He interrupted me. She was my girl, Pete. And you fucking sold her out to some asshole half a world away. Like she was a product on a shelf. How does he know? No, no I didn't. What the fuck is happening, Mike? I asked. He just laughed. You're getting what's coming to you, you sick fuck. He said. I've been working with the cops for months. When Megan went missing, the feds began investigating everyone at the school, and apparently they found some odd traffic in your house. All they needed was a way in, and that's when they approached me. I begged them to let me help, actually. My heart was about to explode in my chest. I was gasping for breath as I stepped on the gas, and began to drive faster and faster. I have no idea what's happening! I shouted, but Mike just laughed. They've got it all, Pete. When you wrote to me to make the sale, you were actually talking to an agent. I have no idea how they did it. They got into your system. They got it all. I'm not buying your act anymore, Pete. By tomorrow morning, everyone at school will know the kind of monster you are. He said bitterly and hung up. The truth is, I did know what had happened to Megan. There was an interested party overseas, trying to get their hands on a young white girl. I never asked what for, but I imagine it wasn't pleasant. And I really hated Megan and her friends. She was very pretty, so when I showed pictures to the buyer, he immediately sent the payment. I got a local crew to do the job, and I scored a nice payday. I kept driving, until a patrol saw me and began chasing me. I managed to keep some distance between us, but soon I heard the helicopter above, and before I knew it, I was headed straight for a police barricade. I crashed into it and immediately lost consciousness. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed, completely restrained, and there were cops in the room. They interrogated me, and I asked for a lawyer. I was told my family wouldn't pay for one. My mother was in shock, and my father was furious. They hadn't told my grandma about it, afraid that she would take the news badly, and that her heart wouldn't be able to take it. So, this is why I've written this small account of the facts. I'll accept whatever fate awaits me at the trial. Probably life, but we'll see. If it means anything, I do regret what happened with Megan. Maybe she didn't deserve it. Maybe she did. But I guess what hurts most is knowing that now, everyone sees Pete for the sham that he was. The charming kid persona hiding something darker beneath. I'll miss Pete. He was a good kid. I married my wife Anne about three months ago. The other night, we were sitting at our table, 
having some wine after dinner. We were just doing our usual joking around and being playful before we started getting into some deep talks. She asked me, what was the worst job you've ever had? Just the most annoying place you've ever worked for. And normally I just give some bullshit answer about how I used to work in a job in retail or the food industry. But I was in a bit of a talkative mood, so I gave the real answer. When I was 16, I used to babysit this 8-year-old girl that lived on my street, Samantha. Her parents knew my parents, and so it was a pretty chill gig. Sam's parents would go out to dinner or a movie or something, and I'd just feed her some mac and cheese, then tuck her in. I made like 50 bucks a night, which was a lot of cash as a teenager. I did the job several times a week for about six months, but there was a good stretch of time during the final month I babysat where things started to get weird. At first I thought it was just Sam's imagination running wild, as children's minds do, but I quickly realized she was never lying. She was always 100% honest. It started with something simple. I got her ready for bed and she came downstairs saying that there was something in her closet. So I took her back up the stairs and showed her nothing was there, but she kept insisting something was there. After a couple of nights of her saying something was in her closet, whatever this thing was started moving around. She started saying it was under her bed, then in the hallway, until he finally settled on being on her ceiling. And that's where he stayed. She always complained something was on her ceiling, and I'd have to read her a little bedtime story to help her go to bed. But then even weirder things started happening. She would say stuff moved on its own, and her door would open and close by itself but the thing always stayed on the ceiling. So finally my curiosity got the best of me, and I asked her, Sam, what does this thing look like? And when I asked, I saw her take the question really seriously. I should have known then that she wasn't lying. He's tall, with no hair, and, and... She was really struggling with this final detail. It's okay, Sam. You can tell me. She swallowed before saying, he has no eyes. Even then it scared me. And even though I had a perfect description of him, it couldn't prepare me for when I finally saw him. This entity started making it so Sam couldn't fall asleep. So she would become sleep deprived and start hallucinating. She would start screaming randomly and she'd have to hide in my arms until her parents got home. I tried warning her parents, but they just kept chalking it up to kids being kids. It got worse and worse with each passing night. Then one night, I was with Sam trying to calm her down while she cried. But then, I started to doze off, and so did she. After I was asleep for a while, I opened my eyes, but I couldn't move. I tried yelling for help, but my mouth wouldn't move either. Then I noticed him. Out of the right corner of my eye, I saw a tall, gangly man. He had no hair on his body, and just like Sam had said, he had no eyes. Not even holes or concaves where his eyes would be. Just a flat surface from his forehead to his nose. His skin was pale, but there were these markings all over him. Some markings were black. Others were red and looked as if they were bleeding. I tried screaming, but it was pointless. He approached me and stroked my cheek with his finger, even without his eyes. I could tell he was studying me. He ran his fingers through my hair, rubbed my earlobes, and grabbed my face, yanking it left and right to get a better look at me. He leaned in closer to me, and I heard him sniff. He started licking his lips as he continued sniffing near my neck. He opened his mouth and let out one big sigh. I started shivering. The room became ice cold. I tried moving my arms to warm myself up but I still sat there unable to move. Tears began to roll down my face. I couldn't respond. I couldn't fight him. But worst of all, I couldn't help Sam. The man reached down and grabbed her face with his hand, and right before my eyes, I saw the color leave her body. Tears were now flowing. He held her mouth shut and looked up at me. I saw one of the red markings on his hand stop bleeding and turn black like the others. Then before I knew it, he was gone, and I was left holding Sam's corpse. The cops came and her parents were in agony for several years. Her father never stopped blaming me for it. I tried telling the cops what I saw, 
but they didn't believe me. The autopsy report just showed that her heart had failed. A kid gone too soon to natural causes, they called it. I'll never forget how scared she was, how I wish I could have done more to help her. My wife was in tears the whole story. I'm so sorry, Elliot. You did what you could. She stroked my cheek. So yeah, that's the worst job I've ever had. Just would be curious to hear some of your guys' worst job experiences. I'll be up late reading comments. I've been having trouble sleeping. And as I sit here finishing this post, I swear I keep hearing something in my closet. My fiancé, Will, and I stayed in upstate New York a couple of weeks ago for a mini getaway. The hotel was pretty dingy, but the price was right and they had smoking rooms. One night, we had gotten back from dinner around 11 p.m. when Will decided he wanted a soda. The hotel didn't have any elevators, so we started the trek to the lower-level vending machines. Once we got to the first floor, we started walking down this long hallway. Think The Shining, when I see an open hotel room door. While passing, I glance inside and see an older woman standing in the middle of a dark room, pulling at her hair with her fists with a huge smile on her face. I instantly start having a mini panic attack. I look to Will and he obviously hadn't seen this deranged woman. Will says, I think we're walking the wrong way. Let's turn around. We turn around and walk back by her room, but I don't look inside. We keep walking down this insanely long hallway and when we're far enough down I whisper, baby, there's something going on in one of those rooms. Something's not right. He stops walking to ask me about it when we see a sign for the vending machines and they're back by that fucking room. We turn to walk back down the hallway when we see an arm sticking out from the woman's room and waving around slowly. Not waving hello exactly, just very slowly wobbling back and forth. Then her door slams shut and we hear all the locks click. I start freaking out more and saying I don't want to go back there, but Will says the room is next to the lobby and an attendant is there, so if anything happens, we can just run to the desk. We walk back by the room and make it to the vending machines in a little closet-type room right off of the lobby. I start putting change in the machine and of course I only have nickels and dimes so it's taking me forever. All of a sudden I get that feeling that someone is staring at me. I turn to the doorway and the woman is standing there with this huge smile on her face just staring at us. What really creeped me out is that we had to walk through three heavy doors to get to this room which means she had purposely silently snuck through. Will and I just freeze and stare straight ahead pretending like we don't see her. I've stopped putting change in the machine at this point and just look like a statue. Then she starts giggling. <laughs> a high pitch little girl giggle. Out of the corner of my eye, I see she put her hands over her mouth like a schoolgirl. I start silently crying. I'm frozen to the spot just listening to this old crazy lady giggling like a five-year-old while staring at me. Then she just turned around and walked away. Will grabs the soda and we book it out of there. We ran all the way back down the long hallway, up four flights of stairs and into our room while looking over our shoulders the entire time. I propped a chair under the door and couldn't sleep the entire night. Didn't see the woman the next morning. So, deranged woman in the New York hotel, please, please, let's never meet again. This happened when I was in around 6th grade. I was one of those kids who barely talked. I just did my work and went home. You know the drill. But in my class, there was this one girl who got bullied really often. Let's call her Y. She was autistic, and as expected from my horrid old school, she got bullied a lot for it. I usually always watched because I'm an observer and I don't really like to intervene in things. But in between the times she got bullied, I would occasionally hand her a tissue to dry her tears silently, 
or silently offer her materials to do her work. That's all it was. That's all I did. Sooner or later, before I knew it, Y became a bit attached to me. At first, I didn't really mind it, until our class teacher decided to move her next to me to be my desk partner because she didn't want to put up with her and actually help her like she's supposed to as a teacher. And also because I was the only kid in the class who didn't bully her, I guess. That was the start of it all. Or, I guess, that's what I'd like to think. At first, it was all right. Why talk to me a lot? She showed me her drawings. I listened. I didn't mind. But then things started to get a little weird. She started showing me her personal drawings, which included drawings about fetishizing MLM, like boys kissing, sexual intercourse, and other sexual drawings. I found it weird, because Y was quite young, so I didn't really say much about it. Next started the compliments. She'd constantly talk to me about how beautiful I was, how perfect I was, how I'm the most prettiest out of everyone. It's not like how your friends would compliment you, you'd know it's platonic. But this wasn't the case with her because she was swooning about it. Again, I was weirded out. Ignored it when she did that because I didn't suspect anything to be actually wrong. I just assumed she didn't understand boundaries, so I excused it. Then it started getting worse. She started holding my hand, intertwining her hands with mine during classes without asking me. Why would rub my hand even grab my hand and kiss it quickly before I can react and pull it back. I was obviously very grossed out by it because she wasn't the most hygienic, very slobby kid, and my hand would always be stained with slobber and drool whenever she did that. I told her to stop doing that. To my surprise, she'd react really badly too, pouting, looking like she's about to cry, frowning at me, and then scowling the whole period. Maybe it doesn't sound like much, but when that person is your desk partner, it's very uncomfortable with them glaring at you and making faces all the time. And unfortunately, it started getting worse again. Ignoring me telling her to stop, she'd continue kissing and touching my hands. Now why actually started touching me, cupping my face, sniffing my hair when I wasn't looking, shoving her whole face into my hair so she can smell it. I'd get really annoyed whenever she did it and tell her to stop but I think it just encouraged her to do it more. Then she'd grab my face and even try to force me to kiss her. I was stronger than her, so I can usually pull away, but even so, she'd quickly grab my face and slobber a kiss on my face before I could pull myself away. Other than the harassment, she'd follow me everywhere in school, to the toilet, to the office, to the hallway, everywhere. She'd even leave me notes in my desk drawer when I arrive at my class. I was clearly very disturbed by all this, and mind you, I was just in sixth grade. You might be wondering why I mentioned she was autistic and why it's relevant to the topic of her getting out of line. Obviously, I don't associate her autism being the reason she's doing all of this. The reason it's important to mention is that the fact she was autistic was actually the sole reason why this whole thing continued on for a whole year. I'd often reach out to my teachers, trying to get them to help me because the situation was getting out of hand. But they'd always brush me off, tell me I'm being rude, and never help me because she's autistic. She doesn't understand what she's doing. As someone who's neurodivergent and also in the process of getting diagnosed with autism, I can say that she clearly understood what she was doing was wrong. Maybe why took some time to understand, but she did know she knew very well. Why just kept doing it anyway? Because nobody scolded her for it and everybody allowed her to do it so that they wouldn't have to deal with her. Anyway, things kept going on like that for some time. That's when I realized the teachers weren't going to help me, so I decided to take matters to my own hands and actively avoid her. It's difficult to do that when she's your desk partner and we also have to sit together in every class, but I did what I could. And guess what? That just made it worse. She started noticing, and then she grew quite resentful towards me for trying to leave her and avoid her. That's when Y started getting physically abusive and violent towards me. She'd hit me whenever I tried to leave. She'd scream, cry, and throw her books at me. She'd slap me, bite me, you name it. It came to the point I came home with bruises all over my arms. 
Obviously, my mother was also very concerned. Now writing this out, you'd be shocked at how my school allowed this to happen, but it was a really shitty school. They didn't care at all. I remember once during her meltdowns, it was during the time we were supposed to leave our class and go downstairs where our parents come to pick us up. Why would always want me to hold her hand while we go downstairs? And I refused, backing away from her. Y proceeds to get upset and chases me all around the classroom. As the students leave and I continue to resist, Y reaches her breaking point. She starts having a meltdown, screaming and crying, and then proceeds to throw her books at me. The teacher, through the crowd of leaving children, finally notices, but she doesn't do anything. You know what she does? She asks me, what did you do to her? Then she and all the remaining students were staring at me. That was the moment I got really, really embarrassed. I was near tears, but I picked up all her books for her, then held her hand like she asked. Okay, okay, let's go. We can go together. I was mumbling that the whole time, wiping wise tears off her face as I jumbled to grab my stuff and leave with her as quickly as I could. I think after that, my mother called her mother to tell her what she was doing to me. Apparently, she got a really bad scolding from her father, and her mother talked to her about it too. Then, the teacher finally moved me to a different seat from her, and I was relieved. I thought, now it's finally over. Now I can actually focus on my schoolwork. I was absolutely wrong. Why avoided me for a few weeks as her mother requested, but she came lingering around me again after the whole thing started blowing down. Why would constantly start blubbering at me to forgive her, and as my mother told me to do, I ignored her every time. Then came the breaking point to her patience when she realized I wasn't going to interact with her again. Again, downstairs, as we were waiting for our parents to come pick us up, she approached me again. She asked me to forgive her again, and I didn't reply. Then, meltdown time. Why threw her books on the floor, hit me, and started screaming at me. This was in front of all the students, teachers, and even my own mother because she had just come to pick me up when it was happening. I didn't know what to say. I was panicking, and I could see my mother standing there also, not knowing what to say. Then Y started blabbering about something else. She started talking about how we already met a long time ago, that I greeted her at the airport, that I loved her, something like that. Then it struck me. I had actually already met Y before years previously, but we randomly ran into each other by coincidence at our local airport. I accidentally bumped into her, so I apologized and I think I gave her an awkward smile. That's all I did. At that moment, I just realized she was still lingering on that memory like it was a fate-to-be sort of love moment. That she already knew me, that she already loved me, that she already knew who I was before I even actually met her in class. Her mother actually arrived while this was happening as well and she hurriedly tended to her crying child. She turned around and asked me, what happened? I felt sick to my stomach and along with the embarrassment I felt being screamed at in front of other parents and teachers, I ran away and hid somewhere in the school. My mom eventually found me behind the school and took me home. That was probably the last of why I've seen in person because then I avoided school and didn't arrive to any of my classes for the rest of the school year. After the school year ended, I moved schools. Now it's several, several years later, and recently my mother mentioned to me that even now why keeps sending her friend requests on Instagram and all her social medias. So it reminded me of this story and this whole experience. So yeah, there you go. I'm usually the first person to wake up in my house. I wake up really early, especially on the weekends. I woke up around 4.35 a.m. I usually wake up later, but it wasn't a complete shock. I started looking through my phone. About 20 minutes in, I get a feeling that I'm being watched. I brush it off. About five minutes later, I start hearing light breathing from under my bed, followed by a light tapping. I turned on my lamp and continued going through my phone. Around 5.10, I get up and go to the living room, and I could have sworn I saw a hand come out from under my bed. Anyways, I head outside to the living room, doing the same thing. 
Maybe 15 minutes later, I decide I needed to go to the bathroom. My father doesn't let us use the bathroom next to the living room as it's mainly for guests and he's scared it'll get dirty. So I head back inside to use the bathroom next to my room. From the corner of my eye, I saw a shadowy figure next to my bed. I walked slightly faster into the bathroom. When I came out, I decided I wanted to take a good look inside my room from the outside. That was the first time I saw it, clearly this time. It appeared to be wearing some kind of black cloak. It was standing a bit closer to me. I blinked and it was gone. I darted back to the living room. The sun was almost completely out by then. I just continued on with my day and tried forgetting about it. Fast forward to that night, I was trying to sleep. I couldn't, so I just stayed on my phone. 1 a.m., the feeling of being watched never left, but it was stronger and followed by the breathing and tapping, only heavier, and it didn't come from under my bed. It sounded like it came from near where my door is. I looked over, and there it was, hanging upside down by my door frame. It had lost the black cloak so I could see it clearly. It was sickeningly skinny, so pale it looked blue with long, white hair. It had white eyes, with red stripes leading to two black dots for pupils. It had an ear-to-ear -ear grin, displaying a set of more than 50 yellow, razor-sharp teeth. It would occasionally lick its teeth, which would lead to it drooling on my floor. It started dragging itself across my ceiling before falling next to my bed and shuffling underneath it, which leads me to now. I'm hearing the same breathing and tapping, only heavy, really heavy. I hear an occasional giggle from underneath my bed. It's been down there for around 20 minutes. I'm too scared to even blink. I tried calling or texting anyone, but I have no service. The Wi-Fi just came back a few minutes ago, and that's how I'm able to send you this. If anyone, at all, knows what to do, please tell me. The breathing just stopped. So I live in a pretty nice area with my husband and some family friends. We lived there for a few years with nothing bad happening around us. It felt like a very safe neighborhood. Now, for context... I'm a very short white female, and I'm considered disabled, even though I look fine. I could never really beat anyone up since my disability has limited my activity severely. Anyways, on to the story. This happened about a year before we moved. I had some stories pop up on a Facebook of some traffickers that were targeting women and children at a local store that we lived right behind. <laughs> I was freaked out. And so I made it a point to not go to the store without my husband. I still got the news articles about people being followed and grabbed and kidnapped from the store. But I felt pretty safe, as long as I didn't go anywhere without my husband. I was going to work one day. I worked about 15 minutes away from our house. It was a call center, kind of, out in the middle of nowhere. There were fields every which way. I worked the afternoon shift and was one of the last people to leave at night. I had to stop and get gas and was a little freaked out because I was scared to go anywhere without my husband, but I wasn't going to make it to work and back home, so I had no choice. I stopped at the station and was slightly relieved that it was super busy. I got out and started pumping my gas when this big van pulled up to the spot next to mine. A guy got out and started pumping his own gas. Then, he walked around the pump and got in between my car and me. He smiled and said, Wow, your car is so clean. How do you get it so clean? I was flabbergasted at the question. My car was a mess. It was dirty with bugs and stuff on it. Why don't you show me how you get it so clean? He reached out to touch me, but I jerked back. Another car pulled up behind me, and a guy got out. I think he freaked the other guy out because he walked back to his van. I quickly finished pumping my gas and got into my car, locked the doors, and sped away. A few minutes later, I look out my window, and the van is behind me, riding my bumper pretty much. I could see the guy smiling and laughing with some other guy. I was pretty freaked out, but 
figured he was just going to the freeway. We passed the freeway, but he kept following me. Now I was very freaked out. The only place on this road now is my work. I called my husband, but he didn't answer since he was at work. I was freaking out, so I just picked up speed and continued the work. I kept looking back, and the van was still there just a little further back. I made it to work. It was a large building with lots of cars in the parking lot. I parked right in front of the doors in a handicapped spot and ran into the doors. I looked back through the locked doors and I saw the guy stopped in front, looking pissed. I ran to my department and went right up to a friend who was ex-military. He carried multiple guns on him at all times. I cried as I told him what happened. I got to work and was freaked out all day. We closed and I was walking down to my car. I peeked out the windows and saw the white van. I couldn't see anyone in there and I wasn't even sure it was the same van. I ran back to my department and told my friend what was going on. He pulled out his gun and walked me outside. The van had now moved right behind my car. My friend walked me to his car. We got in and he drove me right up to my car. Then he followed me all the way home and sat outside until I was inside the house. I could see the van following us, but once we got past the freeway, he turned onto it. The next afternoon, on my way to work, I passed the gas station and the van pulled out. Again, they followed me to work, but they turned away once I got to the parking lot. This went on for about a week. They would follow me to work, leave, then be outside when I was leaving and my friend would walk me out. My buddy told me they were probably trying to learn my schedule so they could figure out a time to jump me. He insisted I take one of his guns, just in case he wasn't there at work to walk me out. I didn't want it, though, as I was afraid that if I had it, then I would get pulled over for something and get in trouble for having a gun not in my name and not having a permit for it. I was telling my husband that evening about how this van was still following me, and he suggested that I should call the cops and let them know. I honestly don't know why I didn't think of that. So the next morning, when I was about to get ready for work, I called. I told him everything. Then I left for work. Just like clockwork, the van pulled out of the gas station and started following me. We were on the long stretch of road that nothing was on when I spotted a car parked off to the side of the road. I passed. And then the car passed. And then the lights came on, the van was pulled over. I later found out that the men following me had several warrants for rape and attempted kidnapping. The back of the van had knives, ropes, gloves, masks, chloroform, and some other sketchy crap in it. The cops believed that I was going to be their next target. When I got to work, my friend wasn't there. He was sick. I'm glad I called the cops that morning, because I don't think I would have made it home if he wasn't there to walk me out. Anyways, that's my creepy story. I hope you guys liked it. It's 100% true. We have since moved out and live in a not as nice area, but so far, I haven't noticed any creepy people around. But I always carry pepper spray whenever I go out. This happened to me over a year ago, at the end of March 2017, and I still can't be alone in my own home. Three years earlier, I had moved into a house that my grandparents left me before they passed away. I had spent some time renovating and was happy enough with it to move in. My grandparents had rented out the top floor to students and had made it into a small apartment. When I moved in, I decided to let my cousin who had some small personal problems move in upstairs while my fiancé and I used the two remaining floors for ourselves. We live in a small town. And like in all small towns, everyone basically knows everyone. And like most men in our town, my fiancé is a fisherman and goes away for long periods of time during the winter, sometimes from January to May. In our town, there are two brothers that are, well, I guess you can call them weird. Some may say original. Though we all know they had struggles in the past that probably is the reason behind their behavior. But my path never crossed their path, and I never talked to them mostly because of age difference. This particular night, I was home alone. My fiancé was up north fishing, and my cousin was visiting family. I had come home late from work and was chilling with a glass of wine in front of the TV. I can't remember what was on, 
I usually just need to empty my head after work, so I was just sitting there in the dark with nothing but the lights from the TV, lost in my own thoughts after a long evening shift. That's when I thought I heard some sounds outside. Usually when I hear sounds like that, I brush it off. I live in an old house. Old houses make sounds randomly, and the rain was pouring down outside. Only once had it happened that there was actually someone out there, and that time it had been an East European group of guys scouting out our house, since some groups like that like to travel around to small places and do burglary and petty crimes. I had this in mind, but I had not been home at the point only my fiancé and cousin was, and they ran after them, and the men jumped in their car, and we never saw them again. I told myself the sound I had just heard was either the house or the rain, until I heard another sound again, more clearly this time, and this time it came from the deck on the side of the house that I sat. I froze as I heard steps moving closer to the window where I sat. The first window this person would come to, moving from that side of the house, would be my bedroom. He or she wouldn't see anything inside there. The curtains were down and the lights off. The steps kept moving towards the door we had on that side of the house, and I knew once they got there, they would be able to stare directly at me through the door window. I quickly turned off the TV so the room got dark. By doing this, I would for sure be telling them that I was at home, unless they came from the forest behind the house, which means they had to climb and crawl a lot. They would have seen that the TV was on from the front of the house. To give you an idea how my floor plan is, my house is built so that from the front you see the kitchen through two windows and the living room through one. Moving around the house to the back you have the window to the bathroom, bedroom, and door to the living room. And on one side you have a couple of big windows into the living room and on the opposite side the entrance to the hall. And all around the ground floor we have a deck. So I sat still, my heart beating fast. I could barely breathe while I heard the steps now slower come closer to the door. The wood on the deck making sounds as the weight of the person pushed down on it. That's when I see a big shadow of a man outside the window, stopping and looking in. I stayed still in the chair I was sitting, hoping it was dark enough that he couldn't see me. As he started moving again, I gasped for air. I could hear him walking into my outdoor furniture and stopping. He probably didn't see them in the dark. For a split second, I debated with myself if I should go and turn on the deck lights, but I didn't want to let him know I had seen him, scared of what this person could do. I lived in a small town, in one of the most baby-proof countries in the world. These things were not supposed to happen here. Well, at least I had felt safe up until then. It could have been someone pranking me thinking they were hilarious, but I was not willing to take that chance. I grabbed my phone and ran as quickly as I could out to the kitchen and hid under the open counter area. I knew he wouldn't be able to spot me there from any window if I sat still. I quickly started dialing my dad's number, figuring it was either him or my brother who would come to help me fast enough. We share police with a neighboring town, and they are usually stationed there, which means it would take them at least 35 minutes to get to me. Though it was late, my dad was quick to pick up, figuring I wouldn't call him that late if it wasn't important. He told me that later. I whispered quickly in the phone, so fast and with such a low voice that my dad couldn't hear me and I had to repeat myself. There's someone outside the house. He just looked through the window. As I said it the second time, I couldn't hold back my tears and I started sobbing. My dad told me to stay put and he would be on his way. He hung up and I can remember how I wished he wouldn't have done that. I would have felt safer had he stayed on the line, but I would soon find out why he had hung up. I tried to call my fiancé, straight to voicemail. And again, straight to voicemail. I stared at my phone hoping someone would call, trying to keep out the sound of the footsteps that I could hear coming closer to the kitchen. Then, absolute silence. I held my breath listening, but I could only hear my own heartbeats. Had he jumped off the deck to the side where it was the closest to the ground? I waited before I crawled out and carefully peeked out to one of the kitchen windows. I spotted him walking slowly away from the house down my driveway. Then he stopped and turned around looking towards the window where I was sitting. Was he smiling? I couldn't tell because it was so dark and the street lights was not enough for me to see him clearly, but I could have swore he was smiling at me. At the same time, my driveway got lit up with lights from a car and I could see who he was before he ran into the neighbor's driveway and disappeared behind some bushes. 
I jumped up when I realized whose car it was, my dad's business partner, John. I ran out towards him. My dad had called him and asked him to go to my house because he was closer. I had never been happier to see him. I quickly told him who I had seen and he assured me that my dad was only minutes away before he jumped in his car to pursue the man. The man I had seen had been one of these brothers that we all find weird. The one known to be a schizophrenic drug addict. But why had he been outside my house? He was not known to burglarize people's home. My dad came and we called the police who came and took my statement. John came back and said that he had not been able to spot him and that he had probably had ran into the forest on the other side of my neighbor's house. The police couldn't arrest the guy since he hadn't done anything. Scaring the living shit out of someone was not a big enough crime, but they knew who he was and promised to talk to him and tell him to stop scaring people. As for me, they told me to call them if he ever did it again. I didn't stick around to see if he came back that night. I packed some things and stayed over at my parents' house until my cousin came home two days later. Sadly, this was just the beginning of something that would last for almost four months. A week or so had passed since this guy had lurked outside my house. I was busy working and didn't have much time for anything else, though I had the episode fresh in my mind every time I went to bed. That Friday after work, I was going to have some friends over for food and game night, so I stopped by a store to get some groceries. As I stepped out of my car, I could see someone from the corner of my eye, mostly because this person had bright red and pink clothes on. As I turned to walk in, I saw him. He was on a bench looking at me with a smirk on his face. The chills I got there and then is indescribable. I walked as fast as I could into the store and grabbed the things I needed before I hurried back to my car. I couldn't see him anywhere until I left the parking lot. He was standing with his bike behind a building, peeking around the corner. As I passed him, our eyes met for a split second before I stepped on the gas to get away from there. That same night after my guests had left, I went to bed and was laying in my bed checking my Facebook, Snapchat, and Twitter, and Instagram. Yeah, the whole routine before going to sleep. I heard my cousin unlocking the front door before locking it and I heard him walking upstairs to his apartment. At least I knew he was home and I could finally go to sleep. I must have been half asleep, half awake when I heard someone knocking on one of the windows in my living room. My heart was beating so fast in my chest and I froze. It quickly went from knocking to pounding. I was sure this person soon would break the window. Of course, the first thought that hit me was that the same guy was back. He had seen me at the store, now he was back to terrorize me some more. Then the knocking moved to my bedroom window. While knocking, he started shouting, Open up! I know you're home! I was so scared, I can't even describe how scared I was. He repeated the sentence while slamming his hands against the window. I'm not too religious, but at that moment I was praying to all kinds of gods. I slowly picked up my phone, about to call my cousin, when my cousin texted me, Just pretend that you're not there and he'll go away, is what he wrote. That is when I understood that the guy that was out there was there for my cousin which meant that my cousin would have met them at the local bar or wherever he had been. I wrote back a short F.U. to my cousin. The guy outside my window, however, just kept going. He knocked on all my windows and rang my doorbell for about 10 to 15 minutes before it got quiet. I went out to the kitchen in time to see him leave, and when he was under the streetlight, I could see that it had been the brother of the first guy. The day after, my cousin told me that he had met him at a party and they had argued and he had followed him home. I do believe my cousin was lying though. My cousin has an on and off relationship with drugs. This was within a period where he was on. My guess is that he had gotten some drugs from the guy that he didn't want to pay for the whole amount of it. What happened the day after makes me even more sure about this. Because the same afternoon he was back. He rang the doorbell and I opened and it was after I opened I knew who it was or else I probably wouldn't have opened. He asked for my cousin. He said my cousin owed him something. I told him my cousin lived upstairs and that he had his own doorbell. I also knew my cousin had just left so I told him this. Before he left, I got tougher than I have ever been before or since. I took a deep breath before I let him know that it was not nice to knock on people's windows during the night and that he had scared me. He actually said he was sorry and that he wouldn't do it again. Fast forward two weeks. I was out on my daily run with music in my ears and not really thinking about much or not really paying attention to anything but the road in front of me 
when I had to stop to tie my shoelaces. As I got up, I could see the guy from the first night standing at the top of a hill with his bike and he was looking at me. I got back up and started running again, but this time I looked over my shoulder and to my surprise he was already getting closer to me. I took a route where I knew there would be more people, but that was a bit longer. After changing directions, I looked over my shoulder again and he was even closer. I begged that I would see someone I knew so that I could stop and talk to them and let him pass. But when he was right behind me, I still had not seen anyone. However, I saw a man out walking his dog and stopped in front of them. I said I thought his dog was cute and he let me pet it. The guy passed us on his bike, but I could see that he kept looking at me over his shoulder all while he had that crazy smirk on his face. The man with the dog asked if I was okay. I didn't want to sound paranoid, so I just said yes. I couldn't see the stalker on his bike anywhere, but I still decided to run back and take my originally planned route. I was almost at home when I spotted him at a bus stop, leaned over his bike looking down on what was probably his phone. I crossed the street and looked over my shoulder to see if he saw me. I thought I had made it home unnoticed. Still, I locked the door behind me as soon as I was inside at home. But when I was in the kitchen getting something to drink, I could see him on his bike slowly moving past my driveway, looking up at my house before disappearing behind some trees. I went and took a shower, and after, I was just going to relax and click around on the web. I started checking my Facebook. I could see that I had a new friend request and clicked on it. Guess who? Yup. I have no idea how he had found my name or my Facebook, but as I wrote in my first post, I live in a small town. It wouldn't have taken him much time to find out who I am. He might even have read it off my mailbox. I did not add him as a friend though. A couple of days later, while I was at work, I get a message on my messenger. It said that someone had asked to send me a message. When I opened up, there is his name again. I clicked on decline. No way, dude. He tried to get in contact with me over messenger for about a week and I blocked him. After this, I one day came home to a note on my door. It said, add me on Facebook and his first name and a made up last name. I think it was Bond or something like that. I saved the note and later handed it over to the police when the stalking got a bit too much. His brother never came back to the house, but the one time the both of them was walking behind me when I was out walking with some friends, just looking at us. His brother also once asked me why I didn't want to add them on Facebook and why I didn't talk to his brother. I never replied to any one of them. I finally got my cousin to tell them to chill on the stalking. This is when it went from bad to worse, with daily visits from at least one of them, but mostly the first guy. I think the brother might have showed up to where I was like three times. The first visitor started hanging around outside my office, gym, house, anywhere I was really. It got really intense. Of course, I started telling more people about this, and all of them told me to contact the police, which I did. I gave them the note and messenger messages. I told them about the stalking and said I had witnesses. They promised me that they would keep an eye on him and told me that it was not his first time doing these things. That didn't call me at all. Why couldn't they just get him to get some help? So the stalking that he did went on for another month and it seemed like he just enjoyed the attention the police gave him because the days they told him to stop, he just came back an extra time. Finally, my fiancé came home from work, and the two of us was out at a restaurant eating one night. I had, of course, told him about the stalking. We were about to leave when we saw the guy standing outside the restaurant. My fiancé went straight out the door and over to him. I didn't hear everything that was said, but I heard my fiancé telling the guy he would put his foot up somewhere. After that, I only saw the guy stalking me like three times. My fiancé is a strong dude, but I don't know if it was that or that the guy just finally gave up or what. I just hoped it would stay that way even after my fiancé left for work. Fortunately, it did. I have seen the two brothers around town since, but I hope I never, ever meet them again. Let's not meet, guys. One or two months ago, my girlfriend and I went out to our favorite bar. The drive is a tad longer than an hour to our place from the bar, primarily on barren interstate after the first 15 minutes, save for a few rural exits and one rest stop a little over halfway home. My girlfriend was sober that night and was driving. 
I had had a bit to drink and was feeling warm and tipsy. I asked my girlfriend to make a quick stop at the rest area so I could pee. Thanks, beer. This is a normal stop for us to make if one of us has been drinking, since the rest area has its own direct exit and entrance, so it's faster than taking an actual exit into a town for a gas station. The rest area has only one road in and one out, and is surrounded by trees to the point you can't see the facility from the freeway. It has wooded walking trails. By the time I hopped out of the car at the rest stop, it was sometime around 3 a.m. As mentioned, this is a fairly regular stop, and until that day, the only other person I had seen in that rest stop around that time of night was the guy who maintains it. I walk in. The vending area is empty and completely silent. I make my way over to the men's room and push it open to be immediately startled by this old man, maybe mid-sixties or so, standing immediately to the left of the door inside the bathroom. He was wearing what I can only describe as an inspector gadget coat and slacks. I noticed he had a cell phone in his hand when I opened the door, but it was hanging down at his side and the screen was not lit up. He stares at me, and I stare back for a split second. Then I get over it and pass him to head over to the urinals. I take the urinal closest to the sinks when I notice he made no indication he was going to walk out because they're basically a wall of mirrors stretched out far enough that I can watch him in the mirror while I'm at the urinal. I unzip and keep my eyes on the mirror but make sure not to turn my head at all. By the time I look in the mirror, his phone is up in his hand and on as if he were texting but he seems to be staring at me rather than the phone. Either way, he definitely was not looking at his phone. A very long 60 seconds pass and I absolutely cannot piss with this silent guy staring at my back from the door. Then in the mirror, I notice him take a small, slow step forward. I tell myself I'm just tipsy and imagining it to just get on with my piss and get the fuck out. Then he takes a more obvious step forward and I put it in my pants while I speed walk to the back handicap stall and lock the door. I went to the back where my feet weren't visible and texted my girlfriend about the creepy guy inside with me. I sit and wait to hear the door open signaling him leaving, but it still doesn't. After possibly the longest eight minutes of my life, I hear the door open and close. I wait another two minutes and finally pee. In the stall though. I cracked the stall door first. Luckily the bathroom isn't huge and I had almost complete visibility of the room from the stall I had picked. I saw no signs of anyone else so I walked out, washed my hands, and beelined it back to the parking lot. I finally make it back to the car and ask my girlfriend what car the old guy got into. She turns to me wide-eyed and says, he didn't get into one. He just walked across the parking lot and went into the tree line. With the rest stop being the only thing on the very short on-off ramps and the other closest civilization being five miles by interstate, I don't know where that guy was going. Later, I realized although the rest area main room is small, there is a second entrance and exit on the side that goes to a patio backing up to the woods. I forget about it because I never use it. But if that guy had somehow managed to get a jump on me, he easily could have pulled me out of that door and my girlfriend wouldn't have even seen it. I don't know if that was his plan and I ruined it when I made my dash for the stalls, but regardless, old man creeping in the rest stop bathroom in the wee hours, let's not meet again. I've actually had a lot of very, very creepy encounters but I wanted to submit this one first. It was my 21st birthday, so three of my best girlfriends and I celebrated with a trip to New York City. To give you background, two of my friends, Lana and Molly, didn't get along that well. The third was and is my best friend to this day, Ellie. My birthday is in December, so it was excruciatingly cold at the time of the trip. We were all staying in the same hotel room, can't remember the name. One night, I was pretty tired and ended up going back to the hotel a bit earlier. I didn't want to ruin my friends' time and I was cool with them staying out later and going to a club. I went home to call my then boyfriend at the time and just relax. I also wanted to go back to the hotel because I was, honestly, 
emotionally drained. Throughout the day, Lana and Molly had been arguing on and off, not really about anything huge, but just nitpicking because they presumably had very opposite personalities. I don't like drama, and being caught in the middle was getting annoying, so I really wanted to be by myself. So, I'm back at the hotel, talking to my then-boyfriend at the time. 20 minutes in, I get a second call coming from Molly. I answer and she's crying. She was always pretty dramatic, but of course, I was concerned. Conversation went something like this. Lana is such a fucking bitch. I'm coming back to the hotel to hang with you. Are you okay? What happened? We got into a fight in the cab and I just don't want to deal with her. I'm heading back now. Okay, be safe. When will you be here? In like 10 minutes, I'm getting in the cab now. Okay, see you soon. We can talk when you get here. I hang up the phone with my boyfriend and tell him I'm going to hang out with her. She comes in a few minutes later and tells me about their fight. I can't even really remember what they fought about, most likely because it was petty and stupid, but we talked for a bit and I told her we should try to get some rest. It had been a long day and I was over all the drama of the day, so we did. When Ellie and Lana come back to the hotel, about an hour later, Lana was pissed drunk. She came in, stumbling, yelling obscenities at Molly that I couldn't make out. Molly said something calmly, but to oppose her. Lana got really mad and kicked my suitcase really hard into the wall. This obviously pissed me off. It's one thing to be upset, but to try to damage other people's belongings is definitely not okay. I had had enough and wanted to leave. One of my other best friends, who wasn't able to come, had a sister who lived in Queens. Her family is like my family, so I texted her telling her the situation and asked if I could come stay with her for the night. She said of course, so I snatched my suitcase and headed towards the elevator. It was slow, so I was waiting there for a few minutes. Moments later, Molly came bursting out of the room. I'm coming with you. No, I want to be alone. I'm sorry we've ruined your birthday. I want to come with you. I don't want to be around Lana right now. She's being a bitch. Fine. Whatever. The elevator opens and we head to the lobby. It was around 2 a.m. at this time, and given that New York City is always bustling, I was surprised to see there were virtually no hotel guests in the lobby. There was one man at the front desk, and then another hotel staff member standing around. It was really cold outside so I wanted someone to hail a cab for me. I asked the front desk if he could have someone do it for me, and he called the other man over and asked. The other man was pretty tall, maybe six feet at least. Not overweight, but stockier for sure. He had a very short buzzed haircut and the most piercing blue eyes, but not the kind that are kind. They seemed completely off, and I remember thinking that before he even opened his mouth to speak to me. Where are you going? He asked in what was probably a Russian accent. Even his voice seemed cold, like it lacked any warmth or friendliness. I kind of choked on my words. Uh, we're going to Queens. He paused. He moved in closer to me and got his face up in mine. I'm about 5'4", so he was definitely bending over a bit to get eerily close to me. To put into perspective how close he was, we could have easily kissed if he had moved about an inch closer. Then he asked, is it just you two? Alone? I said, uh, yes, as I tried to move my body backwards a bit to create some distance. He literally stared into my eyes for what felt like an eternity, but was probably only five seconds. Then he just smiled. I remember feeling so creeped out and just kind of frozen. In my gut, I knew something was off. I looked at my friend, who was obviously uncomfortable as well. It was like she was trying to tell me with her eyes that this man gave her the creeps too. Finally, he backed away from me. Stay right there. He then whipped out his phone and called someone. He was speaking Russian, so I don't know what he said. The whole time, his eyes stayed on me and my friend, and I remember just feeling paralyzed. I was thinking, do we just run? I kept looking back at the glass doors of the hotel entrance, hoping that by a miracle, a cab would drive by so that we could leave. He got off the phone after about a minute, and all he said was, Someone's coming. Don't worry. Huh, <laughs> the irony, right? A few minutes later, 
another man entered the hotel. He wasn't dressed like a hotel staff member at all, which was my biggest red flag. Then he started speaking with the man who called in Russian. They kept nodding while speaking to each other, while looking back at each other and then at my friend and me. The man with the creepy eyes looked at us and said, he will take you where you need to go. Wh wh what Go with him. He will take you. Just then, I kid you not, I look back at the doors and I see a cab slowly inching up our street in traffic. Oh, it's okay. I see a cab right there. We're just going to take that. Thanks. I yelled as I grabbed Molly's hand and began running out of the hotel to get in the cab. As soon as we got in the cab, we both looked at each other and expressed our fear for what had just happened. We both were really scared of the man and agreed that we thought something was incredibly off about the men in the encounter. The first thing that came to my mind was that maybe they were a part of a human trafficking ring. When I think back to that night, I always thank God for that cab. It came at just the right time. I'll never know for sure what the man's intentions were. Since then, I've lived in New York and I've visited again many times and no hotel staff member has ever offered to personally drive me somewhere. I don't know what would have happened had we gone with that man, but I have a feeling it would have been not where we wanted to go. Creepy Russian men at my hotel, let's not meet. Hello, my name is Dan, but that's not my real name. I can't tell you my real name in case they find this. Weird stuff has been happening to me, and I haven't really had the time to sit down and tell someone. So here I am, telling you what happened to me last week. Last week was like any other ordinary week. I'm a computer science major, and I study in InfoSec. A lot of people just call that hacking, but it's not really what it is. You see, most people assume us hackers are all evil. We are all the same. But that just isn't that case. Anyways, last week, my friend, who I will call Evan, sent me a link to a dark website, an onion link, just for some clarification. The dark web, as you might recall, is an off-the-grid version of the internet where all traffic and data are anonymized. This allows people to post and do anything without the possibility of it being traced back to them. This gives a lot of disgusting people a place to post and talk about all of their deepest fantasies, child pornography, live streams, torture, human trafficking, you name it. This place sounds horrible, you're probably thinking. Why would anyone want to see or experience this bullshit? That is the question a lot of us hackers ask ourselves every day, but this is not the only thing you can do on the deep web. But I will leave the exploring up to you, if you even choose to. The website my friend sent me was just a blank black screen. I thought to myself, why is there just a black screen? If this website domain exists, it would be stupid to just host a blank screen. I decided to explore deeper into the website's traffic. This is where I made a shocking discovery. The website was choosing random hosts that connect to it and sending them somewhere else. I didn't know where, but I wanted to find out. That was my biggest mistake. I dove deeper into the website's traffic and I managed to find where the users were being redirected to. It was a very weird website URL. The URL stated, it basically just says, death is among us. That sent shivers down my spine, but I decided to proceed. I clicked on the link and it took forever to load possibly due to the amount of people connecting to the website at once. After 37 minutes of anxiously waiting, the page loaded. There was a chat box in the bottom left of the screen. I clicked on it and there were a bunch of people conversing and chatting about how they're super excited about tonight's event. Tonight's event? What, what, what's going on here? I thought. Before I could get my thoughts straight, a voice started talking. Welcome to tonight's annual event. For all the VIP members, you all may send in your tokens. And for the rest of you, we will begin shortly. Enjoy your stay. The voice abruptly stopped. 
Huh? Tokens? VIP members? What's going on here? After this, I got very freaked out and tried to close the tab, but for some reason, I couldn't. My mouse cursor wouldn't move. I tried using keyboard shortcuts, Control w Control shift escape not of it worked. Then a second later, I received a text on my phone, an unknown number I didn't recognize. If you did not want to watch, then you should not have bypassed our security wall. Security wall? But there wasn't- I was cut off short by a woman screaming coming from my headset. I looked up and I almost shat myself. What I will horrified me and I probably will never forget it. That is until I'm gone. There on my computer showed a young woman, maybe about 16 or 17, strapped down onto a table with cuts and lacerations on her wrist. Before I could process what I was seeing, I decided to call 911. What was I supposed to tell them? Oh, there was this video of a girl tied up with cuts on my screen. But I didn't even have the chance to say that because my phone went to voicemail. Voicemail? For 911? Then appeared a man knocking on my window. I ran into the other room and locked and sealed the doors and windows. Pulling a handgun I had stored underneath a bed, I cocked it. It was loaded all right. Why was this man here? Does it have something to do with the video of the girl? Am I going crazy? I can't be crazy. I can't die like this. Not here. Not now. I was super worked up. So I decided to take a few pills of whatever the fuck was on the dresser. Just some sedatives, I thought. Then I realized, wait, I don't take any medication and I don't do drugs. What? I blacked out. For what I could assume was a few hours later, I found myself strapped onto a table, just like the one the girl was strapped to. Bounded by zip ties and multiple layers of tape. No, no, this is not happening. I struggled and tried to free myself, but I couldn't. I calmed myself down and started thinking, looking around for anything I could use to escape and protect myself. I remember a video I saw while I was in my lecture class. When you find a good move, find a better one. An idea popped on my head. Make him screw up. He came into the room but didn't talk. I asked him a bunch of questions like, where am I? What is this? What are you going to do to me? I pretended to be panicky. He drew in closer with a knife in his hand and that's when I made the attempt. I grabbed him with my legs and pulled him down, stabbing himself with the knife into his neck. I pulled out the knife with my foot, partially cutting myself. Then I tossed the knife up and it landed beside my hands. Perfect. I cut myself loose and barged for the door. I saw the pistol I had in the corner and went to retrieve it. But I heard a sound coming from the corner. The guy was still alive. I took the pistol and shot him twice, one in the chest and another in his neck. I bolted for the door and got out. I'm safe now. That was a week ago, but something happened yesterday. I keep hearing knocks on the windows and doors of my house. This is why I'm writing this. I hope people will find this and help me, because soon I will probably die. I've been running for a while, but I feel like they will find me. Pray for me. Pray that this evil doesn't find me. Pray that we will all be okay. Good luck to you. This all started my sophomore year of high school. I was 15 and at a new school, so I didn't have many friends yet. I was in that phase where I thought I needed a boyfriend to have validation, so I was actively trying to find a date for the homecoming dance. A classmate suggested a junior in one of our classes, whom I will call David, to be my date and got him to ask me out. He seemed nice, so I said yes, a decision that would haunt me for the next two years. David and I had fun at homecoming, so when he asked me to be his girlfriend, I said yes. It's important to note that he was quite the loner. He was very much into science and often spent time alone conducting experiments in his room and even at school at times. I just brushed it off as him being quirky and figured I shouldn't get in the way of his passions, but it wasn't long before I realized there was much more to this nice guy facade. Over the first several weeks of our relationship, 
we would talk over the phone and David would make increasingly inappropriate comments about things he wanted to do to me. I was 15 at the time and he was 17, so not only was I incredibly uncomfortable, but he was also nearly an adult himself making these comments to a younger girl. I kept telling him I wasn't comfortable with the things he was saying, but he always laughed it off as me being a prude. I was fed up after a while and finally threatened to break up with him, and that finally made him stop. I should have recognized the red flags and bailed at that moment, but again, I was dumb and I felt I wasn't worth anything unless I had a boyfriend. Although the inappropriate comments stopped for the time being, he would still become increasingly possessive and downright obsessed over what I was doing at all hours of the day. He would intrude on conversations I had with my friends and want to know things that frankly weren't any of his business. One day when I was getting into the shower, he called and my dad told him I would call him when I was done. Instead of simply waiting like any rational person would do, he called a total of four times over the next 10 to 15 minutes to see if I was out of the shower yet. I began to feel suffocated, but every time I asked him to back off, he would cry about how depressed he was and that he only wanted to talk to someone to feel like he was wanted. I always fell for it like the dummy I was, but now I recognize the clear manipulation that it was. One day, I finally had enough. I broke up with him in person at school and he bawled like a child. I didn't let it get to me this time, however, and firmly told him that I didn't want to be his girlfriend anymore. Although he couldn't get his way, he still somehow convinced me to stay friends. I know, I was an idiot, but things didn't end there. Oh no, dear listeners, we are only just beginning. Over the next several months, David kept trying to get me to go out with him again, even going as far as to cry in front of other people to garner sympathy. He even tried starting rumors about us having sex. We didn't. Fortunately for me, David had earned a bad reputation throughout his school career, so no one really believed him. He would even try to trick me into a date by subtly suggesting we go see a movie as friends, which I always got around by inviting my friends to come along too. They knew what he was doing and never turned down the chance to help a girl out. In the last few weeks I spoke to him, he would sit on the phone for hours on end, literally begging me to take him back. And thankfully I held on strong and kept refusing. One night his brother actually called me telling me he was crying hysterically. Eventually, it came to a point where I told him I didn't want to hang out anymore because it was clear that he would not stop until I became his girlfriend again. He agreed to not approach me anymore, but I wouldn't be telling the story if it ended there. The very next day at school, David came up to me like nothing had happened. I once again reminded him of the conversation we had had the night before about how we agreed not to hang out anymore, but he acted offended that I would even suggest such a thing. Eventually, my friends and I convinced him to leave, but of course it didn't stop there. For two weeks straight, he would follow me around school, call my house and my cell phone. This was the days before smartphones, so blocking his number wasn't as easy. I tried to get help from the school staff, but the vice principal basically told me that there was nothing I could do because he wasn't trying to hurt me. I was frustrated, but thankfully David seemed to back off when it was clear that I wasn't going to give in. That is, until I got another boyfriend. The following school year, my junior year, I started dating a senior named Justin. Not long after we went public with our relationship, I noticed David following me again. Now Justin was a football player and he was a pretty big guy with unresolved anger issues, so he didn't take kindly to this guy. He would hang out with me and my friends and David would hover around nearby walking by every now and then and making it blatantly obvious that he was spying on me. One day, Justin walked straight up to David and confronted him. He didn't lay his hands on him or threaten him in any way, but he did ask, what are you doing? in a really angry tone. David simply muttered some kind of excuse and scurried away. We thought that was the end of it, but later in the day I was called to the principal's office. Turns out David claimed that Justin threatened him and blocked the doorway so he couldn't move. Justin denied it, of course, and told the principal I could back up his claim, which I did. 
Thankfully, nothing came of it, but this was only the first of a long line of incidents. Over the school year, David and his brother, who was a year younger than me, would try to get Justin in trouble every which way they could, even starting rumors and threatening his life. A classmate of mine overheard them talking about ambushing Justin and hurting him, but even though I brought this to the staff, nothing was done about it. All the while, David kept following me when Justin wasn't around. There was even an incident in the school gym one day when a bunch of classes had to stay there for the period. He and I were both there, and he made sure to sit on the bleachers nearby, even following me when I moved. I was on the verge of tears, but then I saw two guys I knew sitting a few rows down from me. They were cool with me, so I got their attention and, after explaining what was going on, asked them if I could sit with them to feel safer. They accepted, and we ended up having a good time talking about music and anime. In spite of this, things just kept getting worse with David. Finally, it came to a head when David's brother wrote a letter to Justin's sister. They had been good friends before this whole mess started, and in the letter, David's brother threatened physical harm to me and to Justin. The sister gave the letter to Justin, who then came to me, and we both brought it to the principal. That was when the principal called everyone into his office and had a nice little chat with us. The principal showed the letter to David's brother and said, I can expel you for this right now, but I am willing to let it go on one condition. David and Justin were both about to graduate, so the principal gave them an ultimatum. He stated that David and his brother were not to contact me or Justin in any way, shape, or form for the rest of the school year, or he would see to it that neither of them would graduate. I was pissed because Justin did nothing wrong, but in the end, we just wanted this whole mess to be over with. From that point on, David didn't bother me again, thankfully, but I am still filled with anxiety to this day. He made me afraid for my life or even to walk the halls of my school. Justin and I ended up breaking up that summer for unrelated reasons, and the following year I didn't have to see either of them ever again. A few years later, however, David tried to send me a friend request on Facebook. I had an immediate panic attack and not only deleted the request, but I blocked him as well. I even unfriended and blocked the two mutual friends we had for good measure. Sure, I was being paranoid, but it made me feel better. There was one last incident involving David, not with me, but with my younger brother. When he was 14, he took his then-girlfriend to see one of the Transformers movies, and David walked in. Upon recognizing my brother, he sat behind him in his date and kept laughing uncontrollably at inappropriate times, and even started kicking their seat. My brother tried confronting him, but it did no good. They didn't bother getting the manager because my brother's date was too afraid he would attack them if they tried to leave. Thankfully, that was the last incident I or anyone close to me ever had with him. I'm doing much better now. I'm 30 years old and, ironically, I ended up marrying one of the guys who sat with me in the gym that day. My advice to any teenagers listening to this is that you should always pay attention to red flags and get rid of toxic people in your life. It's always better to end up alone than stuck with someone who makes you feel bad and treats you like your feelings don't matter. And as for David, let's never meet again.